what's your take on the accession of Finland into NATO? It's new membership. Uh, where where are we going here? It doesn't seem doesn't seem good. It doesn't seem like good places when it comes to mo- a, a bigger and bigger NATO. Well, first of all, we need to understand that um, this is the most recent uh, expansion of the not one inch eastward uh, policy <laughs> that was adopted by NATO back when the Cold War ended. Uh, guarantees given to uh, Mikhail Gorbachev um, that um, you know NATO had no desire to move eastward. That um, you know Russia, the Soviet Union, didn't need to fear this, and now here we are. Um, you know, over two decades later and, you know, three decades. And uh, we have NATO all the way up to the Russian border. The Baltic states are part of NATO. Um, Ukraine wanted to be part of NATO. That's why we're sort of, the Russians are fighting this war right now. Um, and then there's Finland and Sweden, two um, longtime neutral parties. Um, they have, you know, especially the, the Swedes, um, you know, trained in, in an interoperable fashion with uh, with the West, but they weren't part of the alliance and they didn't have a need to be part of the alliance. And Russia didn't view them as part of the alliance. And therefore, Russian military capabilities along the Finnish border were the minimum necessary to, uh, to safeguard, um, uh, you know, St. Petersburg, um, uh, the Kaliningrad enclave and things of that nature. Um, now, Finland has joined NATO and, um, you know, Vladimir Putin has said that, you know, you're a sovereign state. You can do what you want, but this changes everything. We no longer view you as a neutral entity. You're not a neutral party. You're now a, uh, a hostile nation, an unfriendly nation. You're joining an alliance that is engaged in, um, you know, trying to achieve the strategic defeat of Russia, which, if you think about it, means you're trying to kill yourself. Because Russia has nuclear weapons, which will be released if the existential survival of Russia is ever put at risk. And um, the idea that NATO can somehow empower Ukraine to recapture Crimea, recapture Kherson, Zaporizhia, um, ignores the fact that Russia views these territories as part of Russia, constitutionally speaking. The referendum have been passed, votes have been made, and they've been absorbed in. So... Anybody who says, no, we support uh, a Ukrainian counteroffensive, we support the drive to the Azov Sea, we want to split this, that, the other, you do understand that you're supporting a death penalty for the world because Russia cannot allow itself to be defeated and they will use nuclear weapons to prevent that kind of defeat. So if NATO is facilitating um, you know, Ukrainian military action of a, of, of a significant scope and scale to threaten the survival of Russia, then, you know, Russia has a a duty and responsibility to view NATO as a potentially hostile state. So Finland has now joined an alliance that is openly hostile to Russia. Uh, So what they've done now is they have presented themselves as a threat to Russia, and Russia's responding in kind. Uh, Part of this expansion that Russia undertook through 1.5 million men from their uh, uh, pre-special military operations strength of around 900,000 70,000 of those are an army corps that's been created in Karelia um, to protect St. Petersburg from the Finnish threat or NATO threat, but also threaten Helsinki, threaten some of the most um, you know, strategically important uh, territory in, in Finland. And Finland doesn't have an army capable of withstanding this. Uh, the Finnish have to spend a lot of money to re-up their, their, their thing. There's now an 810-mile uh, border uh, People say, well, that puts Russia at a disadvantage. I'd say, well, no, it actually puts the nation that only has 18,000 regular troops at a disadvantage. Um, and, you know, Finland's economy, like all other economies, took a hit from the pandemic and it takes a hit from, uh, you know, Russian energy and the inability to freely access this energy. Where are they going to get the money to uh, to do this the tremendous military buildup? Um, are they going to turn their nation into a... Um, you know, a, 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 a barracks for, for NATO. People tend to forget the history of, U- of, of Finland here. Um, 1939, they fought a winter war against the Russians. Uh, they lost that in, the, in March of uh, 1940 uh, when the Russians broke through the Mannerheim line and, uh, and, and confronted uh, the, the Finns with strategic defeat. 
They then joined the side of Nazi Germany in 1941, participating in the siege of Leningrad, which killed over a million Russians. By the time the uh, siege was lifted, um, you know, and the Soviets were counterattacking, the the Finns wisely opted for peace. They they turned on their German uh, ostensible allies, but uh, rather than punishing um, Finland with an occupation and things of that nature. Uh, what Russia said is, you get to live, but you can't be a member of, of a foreign alliance uh, in perpetuity. <laughs> that means forever. Um, because we don't want Finland to once again be used as a jumping off block for a hostile military force that wants to threaten St. Petersburg or Leningrad. Um, with the fall of the Soviet Union, uh, Finland uh, was able to opt out of the, 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 the in perpetuity standpoint, but they still ostensibly remain uh, 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 neutral. And now they join NATO. Now they have to secure that border. It's going to be a huge problem uh, for for Finland and, and, and a big problem for Sweden because I, I believe now that Finland's in, that Turkey will eventually. Um, that, you know, Turkey's trying to squeeze the West to get uh, as many concessions as possible um, from this and. You know, I'm I, I'm sure there's not only the above the table deals that have been taking place, but there's some behind the, underneath the table deals taking place between the collective West and Turkey, and I think that Sweden will probably get voted on, you know, sometime before the end of this year, maybe early next year. But Sweden too will be a member of NATO. So now we have the continued expansion of NATO um, against Russia, but in some ways, um, if you thought if somebody was betting on this making Russia weak. Um, it's had the exact opposite effect. Russia has expanded its military uh, to 1.5 million new military formations going up against Finland. Um, you know, Russia would have had a hard time justifying these expenses um, from a political standpoint prior to the special military operation, but because of the concerted effort by the collective West to um, strategically defeat Russia, we, we, we now see the Russian population firmly behind uh, this, this expansion of the military. Um, you know, and, and again, I, if I were the Finns, I think uh, you're going to wake up uh, sometime in the next five years when the demands on your defense budget are too great and your society won't take it um, and realizing that you're on the wrong side of history. You bet on the wrong horse. Yeah, I mean, yeah. I'm sure you're familiar Scott, with the way that Finland and the Nordic countries uh, in that region of Europe are kind of renowned for their social safety net uh, and NATO is a drain on that as well. It's, it, it really does have implications. And it, it, you know, with that point on Russia, it does make me think about how, you know, there are a lot of people in China who, while they may oppose U S aggression, they also see it as a credit for, and, and really a, spark for how much people have consolidated around and uh, supported and grown their support in their own government. And, and that's made their society and system stronger. And I see a very similar thing, maybe with different, of course, circumstances and characteristics happening with Russia. The more that NATO encircles, the more that NATO grows, the more that countries like Finland and Sweden just decide to throw away their futures for NATO. This actually makes support for Russia's government, support for Russia and the defense of Russia within Russia that much stronger. No, you're you're 100 percent correct. Um, you know, Vladimir Putin, you know, one of the issues we have in the West is that we don't uh, properly define uh, the problem with Russia. And one of the reasons why this happens is we have a class of people I call the Putin whisperers. These are these fake academics. They're not fake. I mean, they have degrees. Michael McFall has a degree. He's a professor at, uh, at Stanford. But they're fake Russia experts. He's not an expert on Russia. He's an American propagandist. Uh, Angela Stent at Georgetown is the same thing. She's not an expert on Russia. She's an American propagandist. Fiona Hill, an American propagandist. Um, these are people that have um, a vision of what Russia should look like. <laughs> Amazing that Westerners, outsiders have a vision of what Russia should look like. And they've been in favor of implementing policies to achieve that objective. And that objective is to break Russia up into smaller constituent parts. Uh, you see, we're very fearful of the size of Russia, uh, the physical size of Russia, uh, but also what's contained in that, 
land mass, uh, you know, a, a great deal of the world's resources. Um, and we are nervous that a single nation has access to all these resources because they can not only become self-sustainable in certain critical uh, industries, but they will be able to help others. And in this case, others means China with you know, the world's largest population, um, with a, with a modernizing industrial base, modernizing infrastructure. And now you bring China and Russia together in this nexus of, you know, economic uh, capacity. And it's an unbeatable force. This is why the Trans-Eurasian Economic Union that's being pushed by the Russians and the Chinese is a serious thing. Um, I, I, I don't think the United States has properly defined what's going on in Russia. We don't understand what their strategic objectives are vis-a-vis -vis China. We don't understand what China's strategic objectives are vis-a-vis -vis Russia. Take a look at Vladimir Putin's meeting with, um, with Joe Biden in June of 2021. When Joe Biden came out of that uh, without prompting, he, he turned to the media and said, you know, well, I think, uh, I think uh, Putin should not get close to China. Uh, that that's a bad thing, uh, that China has, you know, ill intent towards them, etc. The president was totally out of touch because you see Vladimir Putin and uh, Xi Jinping have had great relations for, for a long time, uh, friendly relations. I mean, like friends, real friends. These are guys that, uh, you know, meet each other for their birthdays. They, um, they socialize, they, they make pancakes together. They make, I mean, you know, they cook, they, they have a really good relationship. And, um, and, and, and how insulting is it then for the United States president to say, I have to, I have to educate Putin on China. I'm pretty sure Putin knows more about China than you do, uh, Mr. Biden. I think he uh, understands the relationship. You know, Putin gave a speech even in the aftermath of the, of the, the recent visit by Xi Jinping. Uh, Putin gave a speech where he said, you know, we have our history with China. I mean, he's not pretending that everything is been roses with China. We had our history, he said. We, um, you know, we have our problems, but we are in a situation where we don't have any other choice. And this isn't a bad choice. It's not as though we have to hold our nose on this. This isn't a bad choice. This is a good choice. It requires some changes on our part, but the West has compelled us to make these changes. So we are going to make these changes. And now we have this relationship that is stronger than any alliance. And I know a lot of people in the West roll their eyes when they hear that, ah, it's just Russian propaganda. Well, if you take a look at um, na the NATO charter, for instance, people like to talk about the strength of the NATO charter, but the NATO charter is far more restrictive than it is expansive. Uh, meaning that once you join NATO, a lot of controls come down on you because it's a negotiated agreement on a consensus basis. It means you've subordinated a lot of your um, sovereignty to, you know, uh, the, the, the totality of an alliance that uh, in some instances is deeply divided. Now we take Russia, China, there's no treaty, none whatsoever. So when people say, well, what are the limitations on there? There are no limitations. They can go anywhere they want it to go or nothing can happen. Uh, and it doesn't change the impact. They still are friendly nations. This allows for a very pragmatic approach to give you an example of this pragmatism. Um, recently, um, uh, you know, Russia had uh, signed uh, some concessions with Vietnam, uh, the Republic of Vietnam, for oil exploration uh, in the vicinity of the South China Sea and waters that are contested with China. And um, Russia has been, uh, you know, actively drilling. They have uh, their rigs there. They're drilling it for joint exploitation. And recently, a Chinese naval vessel came and sailed through there, and one of their uh, you know, an act of intimidation, I guess, against the Vietnamese. There were people that were shouting, because this happened right after Xi Jinping returned back to China. And people were shouting, saying, oh, look, this is proof that China doesn't take Russia seriously. This is garbage relationship. They lied. They're really, there's tensions there. And um, I asked a, a senior Russian official about this, a former diplomat who, old China hand, uh, Maria Zekharova's father, by the way, uh, used to be a you know, a diplomat in Beijing for many years. Um, and he said, you know, look, Russia's always been pragmatic about, you know, these things. Uh, you know, Russia's not taking sides. Uh, Russia is doing what it does and uh, will continue to do that. And 
In some instances, this may cause problems with the Chinese, but the nature of the relationship between Russia and China is that because there is no treaty constraints or treaty that defines things, Russia can be pragmatic about uh, what's going on in these oil fields, um, but still uh, reach out to the Chinese about um, you know, gas deals and other deals to bring in Belts and Roads Initiative to ask Xi Jinping to make a phone call on behalf of a, 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 a potential peace. Why? Because there are no limitations to this relationship. This relationship can go in any direction whatsoever. Uh, imagine that. Imagine the maturity of your approach towards interacting with other nations where um, you, you it, it wasn't a zero-sum game where you had to win or if you didn't win, then it was a loss. What if you actually just sat down and respected everything and, and treated each thing separately? You didn't have some all-encompassing manifest destiny type plan that said America must rule the world through a rules-based international order. But instead you said, we'll take each thing um, you know, one at a time and treat it the way it deserves to be treated with the respect, but we don't allow this to actually you know, dictate this outcome. Um, where would we be today if, if that was the approach we took? Uh, I would hasten to believe that we would be uh, you know, far more deeply entrenched in the Middle East because nations would want us to be there. But when we decide that our task is to illegally occupy a third of Syria to steal oil, to finance a terrorist organization that uh, that, that fights against a ostensible NATO ally, think of what I just said there, the complexity of that, um, you know, then, because you know, that's what we do. That's what America does. Um, you know, but had, had we not done this, um, where could we be? We could be in there, a player, uh, still able to ask our friends to manipulate the oil market to our economic benefit because we're friends, we're friendly. There's no reason to fear us. But now nobody saw, I mean, Mohammed bin Salman just came out and said, I don't care what Joe Biden thinks about me anymore. I'm done with him. I'm done with American opinion. Saudi Arabia has divorced itself from the United States orbit. And, um, you know, this is, this is a game changing event. Yeah, the world is certainly changing and NATO expansion is definitely at the heart of it. And, and the expansion of this chaos and destruction that you speak of, the way the U.S. relates to the world is helping to lay a foundation for this. And, and it, as you said, I, I think it goes hand in hand. It's like it, it's not a bad option for Russia, China, Saudi Arabia, for uh, much of the Arab world, much of the African continent. It's not a bad option to come together and try to figure out something else uh and not least because well the the uh, the other option is is actively harming you every step of the way but not I just militarily to... but but economically i i don't know did you see what marco rubio said the other day right i think it was something about he was admitting fear of this development i believe right yeah he basically said you know because brazil um sat down with china and said we're done with the dollar we're going to do business in the yuan and he's and, and he's like, oh my God, the fourth largest economy. I mean, the largest economy in the uh, in the in the southern hemisphere is uh, you know decoupling from the dollar. We won't be able to sanction them anymore. We won't be able to exert our influence on them. They're going to function as a sovereign nation, and this is a terrible thing. Imagine. I mean, at least he was honest. I have to give him yep. you know yeah. straight up props for wow, what honesty. But. Then the, uh, the the spokesperson for the White House, uh, I, I'll mispronounce her name, so I don't want to say it um, to insult her, but um, she basically was, was talking about this. And she said, those nations that seek to decouple the dollar, you are offending the American people because the well-being of the American people depends on the ability of the dollar to be the supreme currency, the reserve currency, so that we can leverage this to enhance the da 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 and she doesn't even listen to what she's saying. She's basically saying that if a nation decides that they don't want to do business with the dollar, that, uh, that that America will be compelled to intervene because we have to have you do business with the dollar because otherwise you're harming the economy of America. And that's an insult to the American people. Uh, the, the, the arrogance and the hubris. Look, I don't want the dollar to collapse. I, I don't know how about you, Danny, but, uh, you know, I get paid in dollars. And, um, you know, and and the dollars are what I take to the grocery store. 
And it sort of upsets me sometimes when the price of food goes up um, everywhere. I mean, we we have a favorite diner that we go to every uh, every weekend for breakfast. Um, you know, typical American diner, and they they apologize. They came in and said we, we we had to raise our prices, and I'm talking about you know not an insignificant raise because the, just the price of food has gone up. Um, you see that if you go to restaurants, you go to the grocery store, it's there. Uh, you know, the I want the dollar to be stable. I'd like the dollar to have value because that way when I earn uh, $1,000, I, I can buy $1,000 worth of stuff. I don't want to earn $1,000 and only be able to buy $800 worth of stuff or $600 worth of stuff. or for, Because you know what? Inflation is making the value of my dollar decrease. And my employer, by the way, it's not Russia. My employer <laughs> is not giving me more money. It's not like my employer is going, oh, gosh, look, the cost of living cost you, you know, you 12 and a half percent in the last year. Yeah, 12 and a half percent. You know, that's inflation and everything else. Some people say it's even higher. Uh, that means that instead of earning a hundred dollars, I'm now earning, uh, you know, here we go with my military math, but it's going to be somewhere in the area of uh, 80, you know, seven and a half percent of or 87 and uh, 87 and a half dollars that ain't a hundred dollars so uh you know and, and then next year when you factor it in it's going to be you know around 70 dollars that ain't a hundred dollars but i'm only you know i'm it's my pay hasn't been adjusted i need the dollar to do well i need the dollar to be strong and it's not it's failing but that's not a international security issue that's just the stupidity of american policy Hey, I tell you what, uh, Marco Rubio and um, lady uh, spokesperson of the White House, whose name I can't pronounce, um, stop stealing money. You know, for instance, if you're going to call the dollar the uh, the world's reserve currency and people are going to have faith in that. Um, but then you go and you steal 700, 800 billion dollars of Russian sovereign wealth uh, for no legal reason, just because you're mad at Russia. Understand that the rest of the world's going to sit there and go, whoa, I mean, would you, Danny, I can would you put your money in a bank that just arbitrarily wake up and say, yeah, we're taking your account? No. I, 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 I hesitate with the uh, banks. I mean, now, <laughs> like what? Yeah, now it's, banking <laughs> collapse. It's like, oh, oh shit, what's going to happen to our money? You know? <laughs> no, that, that's right. But we, we don't want to give away our money like that. Uh, you know, so I'm not a fan of the collapse of the dollar. I don't want anybody to think the fact that I'm out there defending other people's sovereign rights that this makes me happy, but it's not their fault. The reason why they don't want the dollars, we made it toxic. We steal your money. We sanction you. Listen to what Marco Rubio said. If you if you break your way from the dollar, he's not talking about denied you know economic opportunities. He's saying we can't sanction you. We can't punish you, as if the only thing the, the only tool in the American toolbox is uh, you know from a non military standpoint is the militarization of, of, of the economy. We are going to sanction you. We are going to punish you. That's the only thing we think. Look at what we're doing around the world. The only thing we talk about is sanctions. We never talk about going out there and engaging in a belts and roads initiative type thing. Uh, you, know, you know, the last G7 meeting last summer, you know, oh, Biden's in there. You know, we're going to come up with the counter to the Chinese belts and roads initiative, a $600 billion fund. Really, Joe? Six hundred billion dollars? But it wasn't, was it? No, it was really uh, three hundred billion in contributions, and then you wanted the private sector to kick in three hundred billion, but they're not going to. So it's a three hundred billion dollar fund, which nobody's funding. Nobody's putting money. Up. So it's a zero dollar fund, and you want that to be competing with what? In the last decade, what has China put into BRA? Seven to ten trillion dollars. Yeah. Trillion. That's with a T, ladies and gentlemen. That's a lot of money, and um, we can't match that. We can't match up. We we could if we weren't busy stealing money and sanctioning people, if we were focused on sound economic principles and, and working with other nations without moral strings attached, 